The question is, why and how is politeness oppression? So it's been something that I've felt my entire life intuitively, but I never really had the words or I guess the logic to put things together. And I'm really excited to actually present this to you today. I will be leaning a lot on Bourdieu's Langage et Pouvoir Symbolique, Language and Symbolic Power, because he doesn't explicitly say that politeness is oppression. But when I read it, I was like, oh, he has, he has like the raw materials that I need to make this point, to finally make this point. So this is important to me because I swear a lot in real life, like a lot. I think the biggest compliment that I've gotten from a person was I've never heard so many fucks strung together in such an elegant way. And I was like, well, prego. <laughs> I don't know, I think me swearing a lot and choosing to swear and feeling free and comfortable swearing is just my way of breaking through the suppressive feeling of politeness, of the way that I was supposed to act to be acceptable. So yeah, the video is basically going to be broken down into three parts. I will define politeness and oppression, and then I will go through the three parts. The first part is being acceptable. Discourse, efficiency, linguistic competence of the market, sensitivity of habitus in relation to the demands of the market, manners of speaking, the hexes. All of this is kind of uh, explained in my first video. If you haven't watched it yet, I'll link it down below. But that's kind of the reason why I have to break down to two parts, because it's so simple to just say things but the whole point with definitions and the whole point with the work that I did in the first video is kind of like to show you how the argument is built up. The second part is being polite. So here I explain euphemism, what is acceptable versus what is polite, oppressed oppressor, uh, formulas of politeness of Bourdieu, and the third part is being oppressed or politely silenced. Basically a synthesis of the first two parts and I put it together and I show you how we arrive at a person who is assured and a person who's timid. So yeah, without further ado, let's start. Defining politeness. So politeness, here I've made this little chart thing and it goes through, you know, the general definition and then I break it down to what each of it means. So politeness is a respect for good manners and decorum, good education. So respect is a sentiment or feeling that incites the treatment of someone with regard, consideration, because of their age, their social position, their value or merit. I mean, this is not a big surprise. La bienséance or decorum is the ethics of an epoch, of a specific time. Ethics as regulation of action or moral conduct. Education, the act of forming a person or an initiation. It's, it's kind of interesting, it's just like, oh, is that person well educated? Or it's like, where did they get their education? It's not just about academic brilliance, but it's also about their manner of being. And initiation, so kind of like, you know, the, the fact that you've gone to a certain school, you're initiated to the ideals or the values of a certain school. Like you think of Oxford, you think of Sorbonne, you think about like the legacy and how you're becoming a part of that legacy. But that also means that you're adapting those values because usually if you don't adapt to the values of a specific place you get kicked out. Here we start to see this formation of price and then you can parallel this with a forming of a person and I'll talk more about this uh, in part two. So oppression. Oppression we have this which is the act of oppressing and oppressing I've actually found two definitions that I think helps a lot in identifying a lot of other things I want to say but without anticipating, I'll just read them off and then you can start building them up as we go along. So the first one is to submit someone to an excessive and generally unjust authority to persecute someone by violent means. So clear manifestation of force and punishment. I'll show you how politeness is more subtle and complex. Uh, and if you want to look at obedience, how force doesn't equate to power, please watch the first video I mentioned. And here we get to the second definition. But keep in mind, the goal whether oppression is evident or not is the same. So the second definition is to prevent someone from expressing themselves. Expressing means make themselves understood through their meaning of language or from manifesting, to make something known. I know they're all just definitions but again just follow me and you'll see how this builds up. So basically the second one is to oppose the existence or coming into being of something. That sounds pretty oppressive. My first video, we talk about mind and body, uh, habitus and hexis, and then here you're gonna see how, because with the idea of expressing and manifesting, one is kind of like metaphysical, it's not really concrete, it's not really there yet, and then also the mind and body connection, habitus hexis. So habitus, like, again, the mental associations that 
eventually becomes our physical way of being. So the idea here is that if you prevent some from expressing themselves, you're also preventing them from manifesting a part of themselves. And if a person cannot manifest a part of themselves, a part of their being, and our actions are a part of our identity, you can kind of see how you're oppressing a person's identity or being. <sighs> this, is, this is gonna be fun. Okay, so now let's begin with part one of being acceptable. So part one, being acceptable. So here we're talking about the market of discourse. And again, if you don't know what market means, watch the first video because I don't have time to recap everything again. So here in the market of discourse, here is where the formation of price and the formation of a person kind of takes place. So let's talk about the market of discourse. Les discours pas seulement des signes destinés à être compris, déchiffrés, c'est aussi des signes de richesse destinés à être évalués, appréciés et des signes d'autorité destinés à être cru et obéis. So again, this is something that we mentioned in the first video, but it's the point that discourse and what you're saying is not just a bunch of signs and signals for a person to understand what you're saying in terms of, oh, I have a cat, and you're just like, okay, what does I mean, what does have mean, and what does cat mean, and then you put that together and it's like, that person has a cat. But it's beyond that in terms of it has signs of richness, which is basically the fact that it's appreciated and evaluated and esteemed as worthy, and authority, which is to be believed and understood. So you kind of see here that like you start getting an idea of just because you speak doesn't mean that it has weight. <sighs> It's just like a slight, like Brian does, like a, what do you call it, tangent. In my, and I don't know if I'm going to leave this in, but in my motivation letter to getting into Saban, I actually said that one of my biggest motivations was actually helping people who are silenced. Because there was this little girl who, uh, I don't ever want to tell the story. There's, a little, there's this little girl who I taught Shakespeare at, at a theater internship that I did, and she didn't speak. And <clears throat> it was just really difficult for me because I've always had this feeling that when a person chooses not to speak, they've kind of been oppressed to the point where they don't speak, and then they're ignored after that. And then it's like frustrating for other people because it's like, oh, why don't you just play along and speak or whatever? But it, yeah, maybe, maybe it's a small sign of rebellion. I think the complicated thing about that is that when a person chooses not to speak, you think it's, again, like their choice. And this is where the Spinoza influence comes in for me. I think there are a lot of external determinations that causes a person to choose not to speak. So I'm gonna close that tangent. So yeah, value of discourse is measured by its level of appreciation and authority. So if you have higher authority and higher appreciation, then the value of a discourse is higher. In this way, les discours reçoivent le valeur sens dans la relation à un marché, une loi de formation des prix. So this value is determined by the law of the market, and the law for the market of discourse is linguistic competence. So let's break this down. Linguistic is what is relative to language. Competence is the system of internalized rules thanks to which we are capable of pronouncing, output, and understanding, input. Linguistic competence, according to Bourdieu, is not only being grammatically correct, having technical ability, grammar structure, and uh, syntax, and all, all that stuff, but it's also about being socially acceptable. Statutory ability, being listened to or believed. And this was really interesting because it reminded me on something that I read on Confucianism from this book that my tutor wrote on Chinese philosophy. And I did a bit of a translation, so this is the French version, but I read it in English. The same speech can therefore be considered as a speech of reason if it comes from the mouth of someone who is in a suitable place to deliver such a speech before his audience or as a faulty or inappropriate speech if it is delivered by someone who is not in his suitable place. A speech is therefore not in and of itself a voice of reason or not. If it bears the right name, appropriate denomination of someone of good standing, that I added myself, in connection with the kind of speech it delivers, then it easily gives voice to reason and concludes business. So convenable is appropriate, bon is good, 
and both of these are always determined in relation with others. And I won't go too much into it, but basically Confucianism was very much about understanding that nouns is actually not just like haphazardly you pick like a noun to designate an object, but all of these show how things are all related to each other, but not related just because they're related. They're related in terms of a hierarchical structure. So in that way, when a person of high value speaks something, the discourse which is attached to that person depending on their standing, if it's appropriate, then that has a higher chance of being accepted and believed. And then if it's not appropriate, then it kind of has lower value and that person is not really taken seriously or believed. It's kind of the same as like, you know, you look at a person's CV, you think about their standing before you think about, you know, who is trying to say something. Another example would be if someone's giving you advice and let's say that they're giving you <laughs> like art advice and they don't have any art experience or you look at their artwork and you don't like it and then you kind of go like okay like I'm not really gonna take this person seriously based on you know the the technical ability right but there's also a more insidious one which is systemic issues where we've associated people who look a certain way to do certain things. So then when they say certain things, it comes with all these prejudices that comes with our cultural influences. Okay, so we're moving on now to efficiency. Efficiency takes into account the laws of the price formation characteristics of the market. So again, we're getting closer to price formation, person formation, worthy discourse correctness, and worthy individual acceptability. So here is sensitivity. This is what Bourdieu calls the practical anticipation, which is the relationship or sensitivity of the habitus to the laws and demands of the market with aims to maintain one's level of acceptability. So a habitus, like a person's natural way of being, is sensitive to the demands of the market. So in terms of competence, in terms of their grammatical ability, in terms of their statutory ability, they kind of start modulating themselves. They kind of have this like, what is their actionable response based on your level of ability, based on everyone else in the market and what is expected of the market. So in understanding your value or your status within the market, the value of your discourse in the group that you're speaking in, or the place that you're speaking in. You start to modulate yourself so that you remain acceptable. So let's go on to what it means to be acceptable. Bourdieu says that ces saisons d'acceptabilité est non une forme quelconque de calcul rationnel orienté vers la maximisation des profits symboliques et qui invitant à prendre en compte dans la production la valeur probable du discours détermine les corrections et toutes les formes d'autocensure concession que l'on accorde à un univers social par le fait d'accepter de s'y rendre acceptable. Basically, we understand that being acceptable is what maintains our standing in the social structure. So one's efficiency, ability to get profits, what one wants, having authority or being appreciated by proxy of one's discourse, is value based on this level of acceptability. What did I write? This, as we shall see in over the next two parts, is what leads to self-censorship. This is what we shall see. <laughs> okay, good job, Wani. Quick recap. Efficiency, aware of the sanctions of the market, plus sensitivity, which is the anticipation of profit opportunities or sanctions, and that influences how we exchange or our manner of speaking. And according to Bourdieu, there's three manners that we actually start censoring ourselves. So here he says, S'agissant de production symbolique, la contrainte que le marché exerce par l'intermédiaire de l'anticipation des chances de profit prend naturellement la forme à censure anticipée d'une autocensure qui détermine non seulement la manière de dire, c'est-à-dire du langage, le code switching des situations de bilinguisme ou du niveau de langage, mais aussi ce qui pourra et ne pourra pas être dit. So let's break this down a little bit. So the first one is bilingualism. And yeah, I definitely identify that sometimes. Before I moved to France, I kind of already felt that I was gonna have one hand tied behind my back. And I thought a lot about like, you know, how difficult it would even be to write emails in French. Because, you know, there's a formulation and a way that you say things, even with your friends, like, now you would still say stuff like, oh, si ça ne te dérange pas, if that doesn't bother you, or like, si ça te dit, like if that speaks to you. Even though in English, I guess, I don't know, we say it, like it's not that, it's not that serious like in English. It's like, oh, if you want, or it's like if you're down, like it's so chill, you know, with your friends. 
But I feel like even in France, again, there's still this kind of like acknowledgement that anything that you ask is kind of an intrusion and we'll get to that in politeness. But yeah, like, you know, sometimes when I write to my tutors, I'm just like, okay, I try to suss out if they speak English or read English. And then, and then like I write to them in English <laughs> because, because it saves me so much time from just trying to figure out how to say things in the right way. And in the end, like, I'm just like, oh, I'm going to sound so convoluted. Like there's this one time, like my, one of my professors, I was asking a lot of questions and he's just like, this is really great. You're really motivated. Like you're really motivated, but I don't have time to answer all your questions normal, which is yeah, very true. So he just said, please send me your top questions and I will answer them. And I was just like, you're right. Oh, this is in French. I'm like, you're right. Like, I'm sorry for imposing. I'm sorry for like disturbing you, but uh, like I allow myself to disturb you. This is direct translation. I allow myself to disturb you, to send you these questions. His first line back to me was, vous ne me dérange pas. Like you do not bother me. But it's because like I tried so hard to be polite that I don't know like how far it goes to being like a bit too much. And it was really cool of him, to be honest, to just be like, no, like, you're not bothering me. I'm just saying, like, I don't have the time to answer 15 questions. Give me, like, five. So, yeah, that's something that happens to me. And also, you know, the, the simple thing of, like, ça ne se dit pas, like, something that you just don't say in a different language. So then I just switched to English because culturally you understand that even though your intention might be the same because you want the same one thing because you're one person, but in different contexts, there are different ways of saying things and sometimes you just don't approach or have a, not a demand but like you don't request something in a certain way. So that's on bilingualism. The second is nouveau de langage. I think this is in every culture. It's like level of language, how formal you are. And the last is I guess the most obvious which is what can and cannot be said. So here's where we get into euphemism which is extremely fun for me because again here I attack the idea, the false idea of any kind of sincerity and politeness. And I'll see you in part three, where I destroy politeness. Okay, let's just, let's just start this again. Part two, being polite, euphemism. So I've kind of separated euphemism into two parts, where one it's for acceptability and the second is with politeness. And these are based on two different definitions. So the first definition is a way of thinking, figure de pensée, that softens or attenuates an idea whose direct expression would be brutal or unpleasant. So take note of the word direct expression. So here, obviously, it's when we choose to kind of like soften the way that we try to say things so that it doesn't seem so direct or so frontal. Here I would say is where we are oppressed by the market because we know that what we're directly trying to say or what we directly want or our intention might be taken or we have been accustomed to or conditioned to feel that our direct expression or our honest expression is not acceptable. It is too much, it might hurt someone's feelings, and it's not because they took it a certain way, but it's because we're too honest. In this way, one is prevented from expressing or manifesting their thoughts. So this is self-censorship or being censored. The second definition is a softening of expression by which unpleasant, sad, or dishonest ideas are gentler, more indulgent, more decent, and which give a hint of the former. So take note of the fact that the ideas itself is unpleasant, is sad, or is dishonest. This is the reason why you change it. And this is what I mean by being polite. So this is where you oppress others via the market. Where the first one, it's like you're directly trying to say something, but you're like, oh, no, 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 it's not acceptable to be this honest in society. It's not how it works. And you censor yourself through euphemism by saying things that you don't actually mean so that you maintain your acceptability. But the second one is being polite in a way that you know what you're doing is dishonest, but that you want to change it so that you can maintain acceptability. So then I started thinking about the difference between acceptable and polite. Acceptable, I searched the term, it means worthy of being accepted. But then it also says barely worthy, less than excellent, passable. So you're like at a C grade in society if you're acceptable. But then there's being polite. And this is where you level up. It's like you're well-mannered, you're civilized, so good education and decorum. And this is where like, you know, it kind of ends, right? Because then it goes like, oh, why you should do it and you get values and all that stuff. But no, let's just contrast it with what it means to be impolite. And it means manque de savoir vivre, 
bad manners or like the direct translation is the lack of knowing how to live and there you also get ethics right like you don't know how to live it's literally not just like that you have bad manners like you don't know how to follow rules but is that you are ignorant or radically you could say that a person is uncivilized or a savage and the second is act contra aux bonnes mœurs so this is slightly different in terms of it is a misdeed so you're acting directly against so it's not that you don't do it, it's you're doing something directly against. And because you do something directly against current customs, it's seen as a misdeed or lower in value. Here is Bourdieu's Formule de la Politesse, Formules of Politeness. And again, definition, Formule is a calculation for a specific purpose. So here's where I cry out, this is the death of sincerity. Because sincerity is ce qui exprime ses véritables pensées et sentiments. Véritable is genuine, so sincerity is when one expresses their true thoughts and feelings. And again, véritable is vrai, genuine, uh, what is true, and that which does not hide the truth. So yeah, tell me that politeness is sincerity. If anyone can uh, tell me how being polite is anyway sincere, write them in the comments and we can fight it out. <laughs> I'm so invested. Okay. So these formulations, these formules, are kind of for two main reasons. One is because it is the optimal form of compromise between expression and intention. So between what you say and what you want. In other words, being polite is maintaining acceptability while getting what we want. And the second is neutralizes incorrectness. When insistence threatens to appear as an abusive intrusion or inadmissible pressure, aka the first definition of oppression. So the first definition of oppression, again, is like this very obvious use of force. So here we begin to see le côté néfaste de la politesse, like the harmful nature, the insidious nature of politeness. Now I would like you to brace yourself because I will show you how we all use it and how we all try to get what we want while remaining acceptable. So there are two main formulations according to Bourdieu. So the first is as a question. Voulez-vous venir? Do you want to come? Or doubled negation. Ne voulez-vous pas venir? Do you not want to come? And the interesting thing about double negation, he writes, is that this acknowledges the possibility of refusal. A request without this possibility is unacceptable because it's then like a demand, not an ask. This makes you seem unacceptable, uncivilized, impolite, rude. And if you have to force something, then you lose or you do not have power. And the second formulation is the investment in euphemization. So the first is une forme familière, soyez gentil, venez, be good, come. The interesting thing about gentil is like, bon is like good, right? But gentil is like kind. In the French language, you kind of see like, oh, if you are kind, you are good. They also say soyez sage, which is be wise, but they kind of mean it in the same way as you would say in English, like be good. The second one is obsequious, fais-moi l'honneur de venir, do me the honor of coming. So it's kind of like servility, right? Like, it's like... It kind of seems like a lot, but okay, you do see this in jokes when people use irony. But irony is part of euphemization because it is when you say something that you don't mean. And the third is une interrogation metalinguistique. And this is like, it questions sur la légitimité même de la démarche. It's like so funny. So it is a metalinguistic questioning that makes you question the legitimacy of your approach in general. It's kind of like, not only do you give them the possibility to say no, you make it obvious that you don't even know if you are allowed to ask this or if this is right for you to ask. So this example is Puis je me permettre de vous demander de venir. Can I allow myself to ask you to come? And this is not a joke. Even in my text, right? Like we are in this like WhatsApp group. This person asks a question uh, to, let's just say A, and A didn't reply, but B actually wrote, um, je me permets de répondre uh, de la part de A. I allow myself to respond on behalf of this person. And then they just wrote. And again, big reveal, this WhatsApp group is my ceramic pottery group. So why do we have to be so formal? And Bourdieu says that this level of investment indicates the characteristic of the social relationship. And I translate this to mean that the positioning of each person within the exchange of discourse. It's kind of like the more we invest in euphemization, the more we say less and less of what we mean towards another person. We are aware of two things. One, 
obviously that you're not close to this person, so making any demands of them is unacceptable in comparison to if you're super close, even though debatable, I don't think that just because you're close you're supposed to make any demands of a person. But there's that, but the second is also it indicates the hierarchical structure of because the social distance is not just because of any kind of closeness, but it's in terms of respect. It's in terms of this person holding more social standing than you, and therefore if you want to ask for a certain thing, then if you would like to maintain your level of acceptability and acknowledge with respect a person's social standing and your own, that that is where this comes into play. So yeah, we are getting in our own way of actually being close to other people. Super great. So now let's put all of this together in part three, being oppressed, or as I would like to call it, being politely silenced. Part three, being oppressed or politely silenced. Here I will show you how we get to a being of assurance and a being of timidity. So let's begin by kind of recapping everything and bringing it all together. So again, efficiency is being aware of the market, the rules and demands, linguistic competence through correctness, grammar and acceptability, and maintaining it through self-censorship or the use of politeness. This meets sensitivity, the practical anticipation based on our understanding and acceptance of the market. So both of these meeting results in our hexis. Again, if you don't know what hexis is, please watch my first video. It will make this a lot richer for you. So the hexis, according to Bourdieu, is the corporal tension that has internalized the rules of the market, our position in it, and which determines the way we speak, stand, and eventually how we feel and think. Again, my and here, our actions and being is then determined by our, as Bourdieu says, certainty of the likeliness of either positive sanctions, approval, which is la fondation de la certitude suit, the foundation of certitude itself, that gives us a being with assurance, one with stature and therefore value in society. The second is one that is certain of the likeliness of negative sanction, penalties, qui condamne à la démission et au silence en passant par toutes les formes de l'insécurité et la timidité, which condemns one to resignation and silence through all forms of insecurity and shyness. So this is my notes. I wrote, not speaking for fear of being corrected, grammatically or social acceptability. So don't swear, it's not acceptable, you know. Girls like you don't swear, or only sailors do that, or only blah blah blah. I, I do what I want. <laughs> okay, or grammatically. And it's grammatically is like, okay, just like a small tangent, right? So, one of my professors during one of our classes, I didn't agree with his argument. I didn't agree with how he built it, or basically, I just didn't agree. <laughs> So then I started arguing why it is that I thought that his argument was not sound by, you know, placing my own arguments. And he started to correct me grammatically. And I was like, you... <laughs> okay, it's just something that you don't do. Now that's unacceptable. <laughs> that's unacceptable because we have, we have professors as well who are not native francophones. Like they don't speak French. My teacher for logic, I spoke to her in English. My tutor for epistemology, I think he was from, I don't know, I didn't ask, but I'm assuming from his accent, either Australia or New Zealand. And um, yeah, like one of my tutors is Italian and you, when you understand a person and you know it's not their maternal language, when you try to correct them, you're trying to, I feel like, destabilize them on something else that you can. It's kind of like trying to destabilize me based on grammar and not based on my philosophical argument. So it's kind of weak. And with this in mind, I actually have friends who have really good ideas who do not want to present because they don't feel that their French is good enough. And that is like so frustrating for me because I said like, okay, worst case scenario, there's someone else that can translate for you. But I think what you're trying to present is extremely important. And it was for like a class on aesthetics and it was just a question about like pictures of war being censored but then like pictures of war also being glorified and why is it that one is censored and one is glorified so it's it's really important that the topic's really interesting and she's from ukraine and she's she's an activist but she refused to to go up and speak because she was afraid that her french wasn't good enough so i think this is like one of those things that really frustrates me so, okay, um, so there is, there is that, right? Like, and I wouldn't say that she's a shy person, but I think it's, it's just kind of like understanding that she doesn't meet the demands of the market in terms of 
technical ability stops her from expressing herself, which manifests in a form of timidity because she doesn't express herself. And the other part of this fear is just the fear of rejection, being ignored. Like you speak, people don't listen to you, or they don't take you seriously, they don't hear you because you don't have authority or people don't believe you or it seems that your discourse doesn't have value so it's not appreciated. So then in that way, when you're being ignored, it kind of creates this cycle of what's the point of speaking. And uh, this gives us a being with timidity and imposed self-censorship, believing that one has low to no value in society. And these are the notes that I have to kind of wrap this up. So, unworthy discourse, ignored or oppressed from manifesting by the market, condemns a person to feeling like an unworthy being. And then I had a question at the end, which is, why are then those who we deem to have unworthy discourse so loud and proud? <laughs> And um, for me, there are two possibilities. One, these people could be ignorant of every signal of their unworthiness and they just keep going and you're like, stop, and then they don't. And my other speculation, a more serious and honest speculation, is that these people refuse to have their value determined by others. If you made it to the end, I thank you for your attention and I would like to thank- This is just a shadow of me because the main attraction is the Carol Festival which is a big thank you to Jeremy for being our next exit member and yeah, this is known as the symbol of tyranny and revolution so thanks Jeremy I don't know if this is considered like a unwanted public service announcement but I would like to say that if you consider yourself shy and timid that you should go in front of the mirror and say fuck like a thousand times and get louder and louder each time until you don't give any <laughs> and then start expressing yourself and manifesting yourself in society alright, I'm done